Hi, I'm Dana Tyler, here with my uh, friend, longtime friend, very long, <laughs> and co-worker Cindy Shu, and uh, we're here to get uncomfortably candid mm -hmm. and helpful and hopeful with you. We're all in this. Last summer, Cindy shared her very personal story of mental illness. She was so open, talking mm -hmm. about her journey through depression, a suicide attempt, and the steps she took to get healthy again, a, a raw conversation mm -hmm. that uh, we turned into a half hour special called Breaking the Stigma. And that phrase is, is so important, breaking the stigma. And we're talking about breaking the stigma around even talking about mental illness because it seems to be such a, you know. I don't want to talk about exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Right. And, and it's something that affects everyone. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you know somebody, maybe it's yourself. And, and this, is, this is a special to reach you. You said how people reached out mm -hmm. through email. Yes. They were sharing stories. They were also thanking. Right. After the special that we did uh, last year, so many came in. And so, and you know what really touched me was when people would say, it made me go get help. Good. You know? Let's introduce our guests. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. Dion Monsanto, mm -hmm. a mom. Your daughter took her own life mm -hmm. 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you being here because not only are you sharing your story, but you're also talking about today. We'll get into what you're doing to help other parents, other loved ones, because uh, you're very involved as a volunteer. So thank you for being here, Dion. Thank you, Dion. We also have Dr. Jennifer Hartstein, a child and family psychologist. And uh, that, we know that involves the whole family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, so mm -hmm. thank you. And Dr. Jill Harkavy Friedman, Vice President of Research with the American Foundation for suicide prevention, uh, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say uh, research-wise, you know, who this is happening to, and, um, and just helping us, emergency resources. Um, Dan, I'd like to start with you. You are such an advocate, and you speak to so many people, sharing your story and having very uncomfortable conversations as well. What, what do you tell them? Um, most often when I'm speaking with someone and it's another parent and if their child has attempted suicide or if they've lost someone, I always start off with it's not your fault mm -hmm. because there's such a feeling of guilt, there's such a feeling of shame and embarrassment, so mom to mom or mom to dad, just parent to parent, it's like it's not your fault. We're always doing the best we can with the information we have at the time. And then for, I'm thinking of a family, it was a daughter, and she was really concerned because she'd had multiple attempts and just saying, you know, keep her eye, keep your eyes on her, keep loving her and therapy. I'm like always a big fan of therapy, <laughs> a big fan mm -hmm. of talk therapy, mm -hmm. art therapy, dance therapy, All like it. anything you can do to keep involved and get engaged with them. Because mm -hmm. sometimes as they get older and they want to separate, they need us more. Mm -hmm. I'm a parent of old, adult children now and I feel like there's a little more work. Mm -hmm. with that. So staying involved, I think, makes a tremendous difference. Your daughter, Siwei, beautiful, beautiful daughter. She was 15 mm -hmm. when she took her life. Were there any signs leading up to this that she was in crisis? Because she had multiple attempts, you know, what I learned is that that's one of the signs, is if someone has attempted, they will probably attempt again, and that's a risk factor. Um, she had also been a victim of sexual violence, and that's a risk factor, you know, the abuse in the past that she had endured. And, but in terms of immediate things, I thought I was clear. Now, looking back, mm. one of the big things she had done was give me special items. I didn't know that. And she was such a brilliant, we're a performing family. She's an actor, was an actor. And so when she gave me this dress, I thought, like, what are you giving me this dress for? You begged me for this dress. And she goes, well, mom, you know, my room is always a mess. You'll know, you're organized, you know where, where it is. So when I want to wear it, you'll have it. You know, so the fact that she cleaned up her room and had everything prepared and gave me her favorite dress that she begged and lobbied for. In retrospect, with what I've learned now, I could see she was preparing, but I didn't know. You know, that brings up something. When I was contemplating suicide, I gave one of my best friends her watch back. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is that's something you, you just want to give back to those who are going to be left behind. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Putting things in order. Yep. Yeah. Things in order. Yeah. I'm wondering about Seaway, Dion, and you know, you, breaking the stigma is what we're talking about mm -hmm. to, to encourage people to talk. Um, I know she was a teenager, but in just speaking uh, in, in sort of a bigger picture, uh, people of color mm -hmm. and the want or the are they embarrassed or how do we how do we speak about that what um, minding that's a, that's a hard one my family's from the caribbean and it's like you know you, you can't put your business in the street even as we talk about like i'm in therapy mm -hmm. i'm going to see my therapist and making that statement you know when i was coming up would be a Mm. You know, and then you'd get a negative response. So just having the conversation and encouraging people, like, I'm having challenges when I'm in parent groups, speaking out to someone, you know, I'm having some troubles with my son. You know, I'm concerned about my son. Even if they're like, you know, would you pray on my son? I was like, absolutely, we'll pray. Have you thought about therapy as well? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we do both? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Dr. Jen, what have you seen in your practice with, with people coming in that maybe you haven't seen before? We have COVID, we have so many things. So I think in my practice, what we have really seen is all of this skewing younger. So whereas my practice really focuses on kind of 13 to 25 year old self-harming, suicidal individuals is our hot spot. All of a sudden, 11 and 12 year olds are being referred at greater rates, that kind of middle school age range, than I, and girls especially than we've ever seen. And so I think that was a big eye opener for us during COVID of just like, what are we missing in that middle school age range? And, and what kind of signs are we needing to look at? And I think that that was um, a big deal and really important. Um, and I just had a thought about the warning signs that you were talking about with your daughter. I think that's an important thing that we don't think about enough mm -hmm. and, and kind of what are those little, we think big red flags of all of the stuff. Mm -hmm. What are those yellow flags? You know, what the giving away of things or ch any change in behavior. The room is clean when it's always messy or small baby things that your antenna kind of is like, wait, what's that about? And we don't dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's been a big deal is that we're getting calls for services based on there's something not right. There's like something that just feels off to me about my kid and, and they're usually right. Isn't that too, you're saying go with your gut. Yes. Uh, and just talk more about the red flags. Yeah, and sure. So, you know, there are the red flags we know about, right? Giving away of possessions is a big red flag. Um, talking about wanting to die is a big red, big red flag. Major changes in behavior. So used to love playing sports, no longer playing sports. Um, the depressive symptoms, we kind of think of hallmark symptoms staying in bed more, more crying, maybe their um, biological clock is the opposite, so they're staying up all night and can't get out of bed in the morning. So those are like the big ones. We start to major behavior changes, but we also need to funnel it down to the little ones. Are they staying closer to you? Are they wanting more of their favorite things, like more comfort things? Are they changing some of their relationships with their friends? Are there like just subtle things that you're kind of tilting your head and kind of being like, are they okay? Yeah, they're fine. That's just teenage stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think when you have that moment of like, are they okay? That one step further of, can we, something doesn't seem okay. Are you okay? And really listening to the answer, I think is an important moment. Your gut sure. as a parent gives you so much valuable information. You can't diminish that at all. And it's so much catching those yellow flags early. And we talked that it's never too early to talk to your child about, I, I don't know if you'd call it mental health at that age, but there are things you can do now no matter how small they are. Right, and, and I wanna highlight that all of us have mental health. Mm -hmm. Not all of us have mental health issues, mm -hmm. but everybody has mental health. So we need to stop thinking that you have it and I don't, right? We, we kind of put mental health and mental illness as synonymous things, and illness and health are not synonyms. They are just by naturally not. Sure. So we all have mental health, and so we can always talk to our kids about mental health. What's self-care? How are you taking care of yourself? How are you expressing your emotions? Feelings can start conversations often and early and as young as That's what I was babies. going to ask. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, um, you know, the toddler on the ground, how are you feeling? Yeah. Um, are you happy? Or tell me what's bugging you, right? Yeah. That's what you're saying? Absolutely, we can label emotion early and often. We can express it early. You know, kids are great at expressing emotion. And oftentimes the reason they get shut down is we as the adults in the lives of those kids are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So we wanna fix it. but. 
the best thing we can do is sit with them in their emotion, help them learn how to regulate, help them understand that being angry, sad, disappointed, is really okay. What can you learn from it? And where do you take that learning? And I think that those questions can start teeny teeny. And, and the more we have those questions, by the time they get to 15 or 16, mm. they have the skills to be able to come to you and say, hey, I'm really feeling awful. And they have the vocabulary. And they have the vocabulary. Oh, that's yeah. a good point, Dion. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Dr. Jill, I was gonna ask you, one of the messages uh, that we've been talking about is that mental health and physical health are really the same, but that's not how people often see no. them. Yeah, you know, that idea that somehow your ma mental health happens magically independent of your body, if we really stop to think about it, it really doesn't work that way. We all know when we feel anxious, we feel it in our gut. When we feel something in our gut, we feel anxious. <laughs> you know, there, it's one system and, and, and the brain is an organ and all those things are related, how you take in information, how you process information, how you experience things like anxiety and depression. It's all one system. And the more we can talk about it as a whole person instead of different body parts, um, I think the more we can address concerns about mental health. On the other hand of that, when, when you put them separately, you would take care of that broken leg. Absolutely. You know, take care of your heart, your soul, your head. Exactly. And that's how we think about something like mental health and suicide, like heart disease. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. First of all, you may be at risk for heart disease, and there are some things you can do to take care of it. And um, if you try to do that, diet, exercise, all those things, you might reduce the rate of heart disease. Unfortunately, we can't save every life from heart disease. We can't save every life from suicide either. But if you had bre a risk of breast cancer in your family, what would you do? You'd start mammograms early. You would monitor it carefully. Mm -hmm. You would do something right, right. away. Mm -hmm. But we don't think about mental health that way, but it's exactly the same. Early intervention has a tremendous impact, and it often is about learning skills, changing behavior, and guess what? Your brain is really, we say, plastic. Mm -hmm. In other words, it can change. Just because you have a family history or you've had a head injury doesn't mean that you're destined to something. We've shown that things like DBT actually change the brain function for the better. So explain what DBT is. So DBT is dialectical behavior therapy, and I'm looking at Dr. Jen because that's what she does. <laughs> what she I should do. probably explain it. Mm -hmm. So the idea that two things that are opposite can be true at the same time. And so a lot of therapy pushes you to change, mm. but then it doesn't look at the fact that like you're suffering. So DBT is this dance between accepting you where you are, kind of, hey, life is really hard, you're struggling, you're doing the best you can right now, and you need to do better, try harder, be more motivated to change. And so it works on things like learning to be mindful, learning to be present, emotion regulation, and language mm -hmm. is really important mm -hmm. for that. You know, my, people in my practice tease me because I'm always saying good is not a feeling, bad is not a feeling. Upset is not a feeling. And even anxiety can be broken down into feelings so you can address them. Know what your patterns are, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. People, t for instance, tend to get anxious before they go to a party. But what do we do? One person goes straight for the bar. Mm -hmm. One person goes straight to the corner. One person does, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and over time they kind of relax. But we're all feeling the same feeling. What we do with it is different. And that's part of suicide prevention also, is knowing what you're doing and what you're experiencing, and then trying to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't leave you feeling pain, mm -hmm. loneliness, feeling like you're a burden. Right, and I think, I think all feelings are valid, right? I think we have to remember that we are entitled to every feeling we have. The work is what do you do with the feelings? Because if we could change feelings easily, I would be out of business happily, right. but we could snap our fingers and feel better. And yeah. that's just not how life works. So, we, so it comes to how do we change how we think about something? How do we change our behavior? And if we kind of think of it in a triangle, change one part of the triangle, the other pieces of the triangle change. To get back to your original <laughs> question yeah. about physical and mental health, it's no different in physical health, mm -hmm. right? You could know you have a risk for something and do nothing about it, yeah. or you could do something about it. And the more you know about 
what to do mm -hmm. and you find the benefits of it, the more you're going to do it. And let's face it, we're, we often have lapses where we go back. But if you have the connections that help to keep you connected to your own well-being, and I think that's what happened in, in COVID is that from the start, people were talking about well-being. Mm -hmm. And I think people are feeling crummy. <laughs> There's no doubt. There's more depression, more anxiety, Isolation. more thinking about mm -hmm. suicide. Social media mm -hmm. fueling yeah. everything. So, Dr. Jen, Dr. Jill, and Dion, it, it can be the, the cheerleader, the football mm -hmm. captain, right. the, yeah. the person who's falling through the cracks at school, yeah. the very successful business person. Yeah. We've seen celebrities. That's and right. It's just yeah. each individual individual's complexity. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then it's in the context of stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what happens is we see the stress and we say, oh, they died, they killed themselves because they got divorced or they lost their job or they got bullied. But, you know, it doesn't work that way. Right. There's so but many But for reasons. them at that moment in time, and then of course, when we're talking about death by suicide, there has to be access to lethal means. Right. And we know one of the most powerful things to prevent suicide is limiting access to deadly means when someone is in a, a crisis or it doesn't have to be a crisis but just not feeling well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's that constellation the the risk factors the stressors and the access to means will come together fortunately those moments of actual action can often be very quick mm -hmm. and if we can help people through those moments we can help save their life and just we were talking about using your words and when you have that gut feeling to say to them like you know Dana mm. I'm really concerned about you you haven't been yourself what's going on can we talk about it and you know just being direct because mm -hmm. I think the uncomfortable aspect of the conversation prevents some of us from listening to that gut feeling well, I'm one you, of those people who will tell you I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I can change right. it and turn it to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do that all the time. Right. Um, right. And, and so in that conversation, Dion, also are, uh, to all of you, are you going to use the phrase? Are you going to say the words? I would absolutely. Yeah, gonna, and this is what we should. teach people that you should be direct. Are you thinking about killing yourself? You yeah. know, you're using words like you you feel like you're a burden, you feel uncomfortable, you know, you don't you feel like a foreigner in your body. Are you thinking about ending your life? Mm. You're not giving anybody the idea. Right. If, if someone has, the, I think there's a myth that if I bring up suicide and I put it on the table, that I'm giving you the idea. And the truth is, is that no, you're not. If someone is looking at suicide as the best and only option because life feels so painful and they're so underwater that they just can't see a way to break the surface, you're not giving anybody any ideas. And I think being non judgmental is really important. Even if you're terrified inside, it's okay to be afraid because we don't want anybody to die, right? But they're not going to suddenly like kill themselves right then in that second but they will feel relief the more specific you can be uh -huh. about what you see I noticed you haven't been to class in in weeks I noticed that you're, you're not going and hanging out with us the more you can articulate that and say what you see the better the other thing is some people like Dana will say no I'm fine mm -hmm. and you say okay but I'm here for you you matter to me or help somebody identify who they might feel comfortable going to mm -hmm. right I That's think I think that if I'm worried about what my mom might say, but I'm really close and comfortable with my coach, right? then the coach can be that person, right? Who's the person? Like, can they identify the person? And, and it might not be a parent for a lot of different reasons. But I think an aspect of talking about it is the storytelling. Use this show, use a story, use something as an example. You know, you came to this presentation, you know, I heard this lady talking and she said she lost her daughter to suicide. And you know, do you know anybody? that's felt that way? Have you ever felt that way before? So there's this conversation starter where you're like, so storytelling is like, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not concerned about you, Dana. I just heard about somebody else. You're like, oh, that's interesting. So now you know, well, this person has some awareness. Maybe that will I evoke. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some people, yeah, <laughs> I had yeah. no idea. Mm -hmm. If you were given a cry for help, I missed it. And 
so when this happened was like how did I miss that mm -hmm. you know why wasn't mm -hmm. I there well I'm like you and like so many people so <laughs> yeah. good at masking mm -hmm. you know you know me I'm that I'm the happy one I'm the put your arms up in the picture and that she sort is, of thing yeah. um, but it was somebody one of my colleagues who came to me mm -hmm. and asked are you okay and finally it was like no and the tears came and I left work and everything I started getting honest with myself I mm -hmm. guess you know um, and I asked her later, what did you see in me that made you ask? Are you okay? And she said she saw the light go out of my eyes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the person is different. The person who was like this is like this. Yeah. You, know? but you still tried. Yes. Yes. Um, and I'm so grateful I'm here. I am too. We are too. We all, we all are. are. Yeah. When a person's in that state, they don't have access to their usual coping. Mm -hmm. So us expecting people in the in the depth of pain to say, oh, by the way, I'm not feeling great, you know, come, it often doesn't happen because the way the brain works in that moment is, you know, people can say things like, I love my family, my family loves me, but they'll be better off without me. Mm -hmm. That's completely mm -hmm. illogical, mm -hmm. but that's how the, the the brain is you don't see the other options that are out there it's not that there are no options it's that you don't see them and also there's a possibility you might act more on impulse it's important to uh, I've learned this from Cindy and um, the, the family involvement yes mm -hmm. you know n not only pre during right and in your case after I mean this right. just doesn't end mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of examination and and even more openness that needs to happen that's true and then the whole family also in a sense needs to be treated mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's not just the person who's suffering because so often you you focus on the person who's suffering and you don't take care of yourself what would you say to family members and friends one of the things we recommend certainly is since I specialize in, in working with young people is do their families need to be in their own treatment do they need parenting support because there is a lot of guilt and shame about not being able to do the right thing or preventing it or protecting them or what could they have done differently so a lot of parenting support we offer we have a group for families to come together so they can learn skills and strategies on how to talk to each other differently or use emotion regulation strategies or just you know all the different skills that the family learns together so i think that if we're talking about one person needing treatment why not look at the system and where the system might need treatment. What if I don't have insurance? What mm -hmm. what are the rates now, Dr. Yeah, Jill? So there are some services where people can find free or low cost care. Of course, they have long lines and waiting lists like everybody else. But uh, we have some places on our website. Mm -hmm. You can also um, call your local hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go to maybe the counselors in the school if you have a child, mm -hmm. uh, local VA if you're involved with the VA, or you're a veteran and you don't know where to go. They can tell you outside services. It doesn't have to be at the VA. So use the local resources. In all honesty, it is not easy to find mental health care, whether you can pay for it or not. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is you have a person who's feeling terrible, doesn't have access to thinking flexibly, and then they're supposed to make 15 phone calls to people they don't know mm -hmm. to get therapy. So I would say that the whole system is kind of broken. And then there are the meds. And yeah, then right. the medications. Often if you contact the uh, pharmaceutical companies, they will help you yeah. to get funding. You can get discounted yeah. medications if you can, you know, you call and you say, I can't afford whatever this is. They will give you access for a, up to a year or two years of, of decreased fees. And to add on to what you're saying, if someone is in crisis, I think there is also a stigma of taking someone to the emergency room. Mm. And you get faster access to care for anything if you go to the emergency room. And so if you're really worried about someone's safety, call 911, take them to the emergency room because you will get faster access to care and emergency rooms can't turn you away. They have to treat you. Also, I wanted to add to what Dana said because I was in corporate America when all of this was happening and the EAP services, mm -hmm. the em yes. employee assistance programs. And because of the whole stigma and concern about privacy, I was in financial services and people, those services are underutilized. So I'm always saying it's a different number at every company, but if you are employed, 90% of the companies have some sort of employee assistance program that has to stay confidential that has to stay confidential yeah. thank you so much for this conversation I just wanted to see um, any any final thoughts Dion um, I always come back to the parents the parents the siblings the grandparents um, enjoy your family talk to them but 
if you're facing this crisis and someone has attempted suicide or someone has completed suicide, I always want to leave them with, it's not your fault. And I will just say that there is hope. You know, I've been to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom where I didn't want to live anymore. Then I got the help I needed. Still getting the help I need, therapy, medication. Um, and this is part of my healing, mm -hmm. having these conversations to help others. Breaking the stigma, yep. encouraging other people. Um, and that's, I would add to that saying, um, it, it, it's okay if it's a cry for help. It, it's a scream for help. Um, don't be afraid. Um, you are loved. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us for this very important conversation. Thank you to our guests for being here, sharing their insights, Cindy, for being so open and helpful as well. We want to remind you we have a section on our website dedicated to important resources, which include phone numbers and websites, as well as conversation guides, how to get the conversation going among you and your loved ones. And if you or someone you know needs help, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network has a 24-7 crisis hotline. It's 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. You can also text the word talk to 741-741 and you'll be texting with a trained crisis counselor anytime for free. Remember, you are not alone. <laughs>